Our last speaker is Eden Nabi. Uh, she's a cultural historian of the Middle East and Central Asia. She began her career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Afghanistan and moved on to a PhD at Columbia University that led eventually to her application of ethnic and religious minority studies to the study of Assyrians in the Middle East. Among her many articles on Assyrians are the uh, key introduction to Assyrians in the former Soviet Union, the use of the pre-World War I Assyrian periodical press to analyze Assyrian cultural progress, and her work at the Foundation for Endangered Languages. Uh, she also, um, she pu also published in the Encyclopedia Iranica. Her books include Afghanistan, uh, Mullah, Marx, and Mujahid. Um, the work was published uh, first in 1999, and it received a second edition in 2002. And the forthcoming book is entitled Assyrians of the Middle East. Her lecture today is entitled Sharing Identity Preservation in the 21st Century, Assyrians and Armenians. Thank you very much for joining us. This is my second Ron Dink conference, and I'm, I appreciate very much being included. Sometimes when you look at a contrasting community like the Assyrians, <coughs> which have a, a number of similarities to Armenian communities, but not always, and I hope that during this presentation, I will be able to point out both the ways that they are similar and the ways that they differ from each other and therefore uh, show how institutions, language, and location determine whether a group can continue to exist in the Middle East. My conclusion, which I will anticipate now, is that the Assyrians are in an existential danger of losing their foothold completely in the Middle East because for them the genocide has not ended and it continues in Iraq and in Syria. So let me, let me begin with a, a bit of a detail about this uh, situation, but, be, but also talk about uh, how the two communities uh, are similar and differ. Uh, in key ways, Assyrians are a mirror for Armenians on the issue of identity. It is true that Assyrians emerged from World War I with far greater proportional loss of population than the Armenians due to genocide <clears throat> because they had smaller established diaspora communities, especially in the Arab world, and far s smaller numbers to begin with. Probably Assyrians are about a quarter to uh, a third of the population of uh, Armenians globally. Uh, and barely a third of the population of the Ar Assyrians uh, survived the events after 1914. But despite British promises and faithful service to the French and the British mandates during the interwar period, the Assyrians did not receive the promise of territoriality, the goal they wanted and deserved. But Assyrians validate the genocide uh, perpetuated against Christians in eastern Turkey. They attempt to follow Armenians and Jewish steps taken to retain and forge identity for the 21st century and periodically worry about the swamping of Assyrian identity by Armenian culture in the geographic locations in which they, are, they share. Patterns for language study, community organization, and popularizing a historical narrative are emerging, but the Assyrian institutional secular structure has been and continues to be weak. The oldest current Assyrian secular institution, the Assyrian American National Federation, dates from 1933 and has sporadically been subservient to tribal or Church of the East politics and has not systematically served the entire Assyrian community. That community, with four competing delegations sent to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, represented all the Assyrian patriarchates and sections of the diaspora uh, from the United States and Russia. 
But in today's war ravaged Iraq and Syria, the four main Assyrian patriarchates, each petitions and is solicited by Erbil and Baghdad and Damascus through the patriarchs, men who guard jealously the political power they flatter themselves they have. So here is a quick outline of the Assyrian patriarchates that are currently functioning. This means that these, all these patriarchates have a structure. They are competing with each other. There are two Catholic Assyrian patriarchates. There is the Syriac Orthodox, which used to be called ap apostolic as well. There is the church, Assyrian Church of the East, which is the one that is known best along the Silk Road for taking uh, Christianity to, to China and to India. But then in 1966, there was a break from the Assyrian Church of the East with a, another patriarchate called the Ancient Church of the East. All of these function in Iraq. All of these organizations are far stronger, these patriarchates are far stronger than any secular organization that the Assyrians have. Therefore, in Iraq, after the US invasion, there was no unified Assyrian presence either in the parliament or in any of the governmental areas. And the same is true now in the, in the areas that are run by the KDP. So because of the strength of the patriarchates, let's not even talk about the Protestants, which are not so significant in Iraq, but were in Iran. Because of the presence of these patriarchates, it is very, it's been very difficult to express a united Assyrian um, political stance with regard to any of the governments in the Middle East. There is also this breakdown of Syriac, uh, and Aramaic as a language, and I'm going to refer to the language, the spoken language as Aramaic, because Syriac was the Aramaic language of Urfa developed in the third century into the literary language of Christians. This is all up here. I hope you can see it. Yes. Um, Syriac continues to be the language of liturgy for all the Assyrian patriarchal churches. Syriac, however, is no longer a spoken language. Neo-Syriac, wrongly applied to Assyrian Neo-Aramaic by 19th century missionaries and scholars. Today, the language that is most commonly used and spoken and written is Assyrian Neo-Aramaic, which does not grow out of Syriac, but rather antecedents that were not written. But altogether, Aramaic is the uh, oldest spoken language, uh, oldest written language of the area. Um, now, the terms Assyrian, Syrian, and Aramean may need a little bit of explanation. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but there has been uh, an inscription outside Adana that has, been, that has been deciphered that proves what Herodotus had said that Assyrian and Syrian are actually the same word. One is used in the East and one is used in the West. Aramaean is a relatively new term revived from biblical use but will not enter into our conversation. The relationship between Assyrians and Armenians then has been a very close one, particularly in Southeast Turkey and in places like Aleppo. Uh, after the genocide, the survivors from Carput, for example, uh, when they arrived in Boston, which was an area to which Armenians and Assyrians migrated to the United States from Carput, uh, published a newspaper, a magazine, a periodical, monthly, uh, that appeared, uh, it was under the name Babylon, but it appeared in Armenian letters. We just heard the previous speaker also speak about that situation uh, where you have a language that is uh, spoken but not uh, necessarily written. It's a very complicated situation about why the vernacular was not written in Southeast Turkey. Now, um, the Church of the East 
which is the main and earliest of the of the Assyrian churches in in the in the area, uh, is one that is anathemized by the Monophysite churches, and little known in Europe, was not in communion with any neighboring churches, and its congregants did not intermarry. This was intermarry with other Christians. This was true in the past, and it is to a great extent also true today. Even though it is not a very large church, it is a church that has stuck to its traditions almost with a vengeance. But this means that it is having trouble facing the 21st century, largely because it is not a language it is not a community that is particularly literate in its own uh, spoken language. In Western diaspora, the matter of intermarriage with outsiders, which is a key issue for Armenians in diaspora as well, uh, is one that is serious for all of the other patriarchates except for the Church of the East. Now, I want to just uh, show you where the Assyrians lived before the genocide. They were concentrated in five areas. And after the genocide and after the convulsions in the Middle East, they are scattered, as you can see, quite broadly all over, from New Zealand all the way over to uh, Vancouver and the Bay Area. The <coughs> issue of... Uh, territoriality, we've already spoken about, that they did not get a territory. However, it is not a dead issue. The Assyrians in Iraq insist that they will be able to stay on the Nineveh plain once uh, ISIS is driven out of the area, out of Mosul and out of the Nineveh plain. However, to support this position, the Assyrian diaspora which forms the largest part of the Assyrian community globally, the Assyrian diaspora must put out a great deal of money in order to support both the existence of the refugees, the running of the schools and medical facilities that used to exist on the Nineveh Plain but now are displaced, hopefully temporarily, and with ISIS, there is also the added problem of having to pay ransom because Assyrian villages along the Khabar River, 35 villages, were captured by ISIS. Many people, hundreds, were taken hostage, and their families and the churches paid ransom to be able to get some of them back. So this is draining the facilities, the financial ability of the diaspora, perhaps to a hopeless end, because will Assyrians actually survive in Iraq, the place from which they originate thousands of years ago, millennia? The question then becomes, how can the diaspora both support the existence of an Assyrian community in Iraq, which has dwindled from 1.2 million in 2003 to perhaps only 300,000 now, as well as continue cultural activities in diaspora. This is a very serious issue, which means that we have, the Assyrians have virtually no schools in diaspora. The continuation of the language, therefore, becomes a an issue that is uh, virtually unsolvable. And the churches currently, and throughout the, 19th, uh, throughout the 20th century, when there were opportunities for Assyrians to leave, perhaps to go to Brazil in one case in the 1930s, backed by the League of Nations, the churches insisted, the patriarchal churches insisted that people remain in the Middle East and remain loyal to the countries in which they lived. Today, when the Assyrian community is facing virtual extinction in the Middle East due to not just, even if ISIS leaves, there's a problem with what the Kurds insist the Assyrians do, that has become members of the Kurdish parties, and deny their ethnic name, calling themselves Christian Kurds, all of these things mean that the Assyrians are in very difficult conditions in the Middle East. 
the, the churches do not back the, uh, the uh, immigration from the Middle East. All of the patriarchates are located in Iraq or in Syria, and they want the, uh, con their congregants to remain in the Middle East. But there is a draining of population uh, because people really must look out for their own safety. For example, not only were they scattered as they are in this, but we also have periodically, let's say, 100 families moving to Slovakia, where there are absolutely no Assyrians. There may be Armenians, but there are no Assyrians. This means that the community becomes even more scattered. So the problem of not having secular organizations that are successful in withstanding the power of the patriarchal churches is a problem that appears unsolvable. If the Assyrians, which are the easternmost Christians in the Middle East, disappear, I don't think there's, there's a whole lot of hope for those that are in, in the western part. There, is a, there has been a tendency to wash Christians including Assyrians and Armenians, over toward the Mediterranean into Lebanon. How long that will continue is a, a problem, uh, and it doesn't look like it's solvable. So what does this mean then for the issue of, um, of uh, culture and retention of culture in the 21st century? My conclusion is that there is a real fear that uh, that as that the long, uh, that as long as the language has lasted, which is for millennia, and the cultural traditions have survived despite, despite genocide, that the resources of the diaspora cannot continue to support both the safety of Assyrians in the Middle East and the development of viable schools, cultural institutions in, the, in its most vibrant diaspora communities. And this, I think, I sh submit is a situation that is very different from Armenians in the 20 early part of the 21st century, but who knows what the Middle East is going to be like. Thank you.